This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service that premieres a new film every day. I don't have low self-esteem. I have low esteem for everyone else. Daria Morgendorfer made it cool to be a wry and cynical loner. This teen girl who didn't care about popularity or trends was the picture-perfect example of 90s alienation. The question is, am I supporting my friend or her surrender to the system? Do you mind? This is a private conversation. From her early days as one of the only students who seemed to sort of understand the mentality behind her idiot classmates Beavis and Butthead, to her five seasons as the anchor of her own animated spinoff, Daria was a fixture on MTV from the mid-90s into the early 2000s. And she was a surprising character for a channel that often sold brash, extroverted, or overtly sexualized versions of womanhood during that same period. My world would be made fair through the simple step of eliminating all money. Years later, Daria still resonates with anyone who's ever questioned whether the problem is you or the system you're living in. And it can help us understand cultural changes that were happening back in the 1990s. As Sonia Soraya wrote in Variety, at the turn of the millennium, MTV was saturated with Backstreet Boys and NSYNC music videos and obsessed with the nascent careers of Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears. Daria became one of the first characters I saw on television who seemed to feel the way I did about the world. There's no aspect, no facet, no moment of life that can't be improved with pizza. Here's our take on how Daria sees the world and how her show captured both the 90s where it began and the decade that would follow. My goal is not to wake up at 40 with the bitter realization that I've wasted my life in a job I hate because I was forced to decide on a career in my teens. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. Daria began as a side character on the 90s cartoon Beavis and Butthead, where she acted as an occasional foil, issuing detached commentary on the boys' juvenile antics. I knew you guys would screw this up. I just had to see for myself. While she clearly and correctly thought Beavis and Butthead were stupid teenage boys, it was vaguely implied she had a certain affection for their idiocy. They were cretins, but they were fellow outsiders who were unapologetically and unavoidably themselves. Beavis and Butthead were also emblematic of the dead-end stupidity of their barren town of Highland, Texas. For her spin-off series, Daria moves to Lawndale, an unspecified but seemingly more affluent suburb, and the show explores her point of view about the vapid, vacuous, and sometimes mean-spirited teenagers and adults surrounding her. You know what I tell myself, Quinn? If not you, who? If not now, when? If not leave, puke. One of her most consistent targets of disdain is Quinn, her younger, conventionally attractive, sometimes cruel, and extremely popular sister. An embodiment of the consumerism-driven superficiality that Daria sees as eye-rollingly phony and ultimately pointless. He spent the whole dinner talking about himself and then accused me of not paying attention just because I had to quickly check my lipstick and the butter knife. Wait! Where are you going? Quinn is shown as aggressively superficial for buying into the most reductive ideas about beauty, gender, and social currency. Well, how do I make them by acting like you don't care what they think. But I do care what they think. It's why I do what I do, wear what I wear, say what I say. Before this point, Daria's deadpan affect was more often seen as the voice of the sarcastic best friend, not the main character of this kind of show. My hormones don't rage. Oh, sure, they get mad sometimes, but then they just stop speaking to each other. Cher from Clueless, for example, more closely resembles Quinn than Daria, though Cher's shading and complexity makes her more immediately likable. May I please remind you that it does not say RSVP on the Statue of Liberty. Even contemporaneous teen girl characters with more going on than Quinn Morgendorfer tended to still be more emotionally open than Daria. Look at Angela Chase from My So-Called Life, which debuted around the same time as Beavis and Butthead. Angela's not one of the popular girls, but she's also not as uninterested in her peers and family as Daria is. I just like how he's always leaning against stuff. He leans great. Another aspect of Daria's personality is that throughout the series, she chafes at the way people try to read or pigeonhole her based on her deadpan mannerism and lack of school spirit enthusiasm. You're one of those misery chicks, always moping about what a cruel world it is, making a big deal about it so people won't notice you're a loser. She's often annoyed or even hurt when she's perceived by classmates as gloomy or dark. You're used to being all gloomy and depressed and thinking about bad stuff. Why does 
does everyone keep saying that? She thinks of herself as realistic and intelligent more than outright depressive. I knew I could talk to you, Daria. You're always miserable, but I'm not miserable. I'm just not like them. It's part of the show's interest in what it's like to actually be an outsider. Showrunner and co-creator Glenn Eichler explains, Somebody said something about this show on like a message board and it was my favorite thing I ever read about it. If it weren't so funny, it would be unbearably sad. We were trying to process all those horrible things in a lighthearted way and let people exhale a little bit and say it's not just me or thank God I'm not there anymore. In addition to sadness, there's an undercurrent of anger to Daria's worldview. Daria probably wouldn't describe herself as an angry person and certainly doesn't present that way with her quiet, even-handed delivery. Where do you think you're going? Slowly insane but I need to pop in at home first. But people who use a lot of sarcasm are sometimes hiding a sincere sense of anger and hurt. Daria's home life is generally supportive, though her parents may be clueless and unlike her in their temperaments, they clearly love her. Yet she doesn't always trust that support or love. You don't make friends as easily as uh, some people. Quinn, for instance? That's not what I meant, necessarily. It may even be that seeing the unconditional love they have for Quinn makes Daria feel suspicious of those feelings, though overall her family does reveal more depth as the show goes on. Now nothing's under control. It never is, sweetie. We just tell ourselves otherwise so we can function. Life sucks. Yes, sometimes. Often. That's reassuring. But it still beats the alternative. But even as her view of her family or peers may soften, Daria sees the world as valuing stupid, superficial, or shallow things like good looks, popularity, conformity, and deference to authority, and putting on airs about why they value those things in the first place. It's about whether a public high school should be using its status as a place of authority to serve as one more marketing tentacle of corporate America. She has a clear yearning to escape her current life and move on to something else. Her two made-for-MTV specials are called Is It Fall Yet? and Is It College Yet? conveying a tired impatience. Still, she doesn't always seem to have a firm plan about how she might accomplish this, or even know whether it's possible. That all of these emotions can exist beneath the surface of a sarcastic teenage girl makes her deceptively relatable. Part of the appeal of Daria is that she feels like a real, authentic person, and her worldview was one that viewers of all stripes could relate to, even if they weren't specifically a glasses-wearing teenage girl with a deadpan affect. You guys are hopeless. Damn it, she saw right through our facade of hopefulness. As the show's supervising director Karen Disher explained, Daria was always written gender neutral. Glenn was very specific about that. There are no episodes where they're talking about their periods or having slumber parties. This is the kind of activity that teen girls do together to cement their friendships. Don't you want to cement our friendship? I'd probably do better with actual cement. At the same time, Daria does embody a strong, unique form of feminist teenage girlhood. She's an unwitting tour guide through a version of high school where the goal isn't necessarily getting the guy or undergoing a popularity makeover, but just getting through it because it just kind of inherently sucks a lot of the time. Or possibly just another adolescent embarrassment she'll need to repress in adulthood just to get out of bed in the morning. Huh. So far, that makes everything after my 12th birthday. Daria's situation may not be especially enviable, but for a lot of people who identified with her feelings, frustrations, and introversion, her personality was something approaching aspirational. He said he looked up to you? Isn't that weird? Flattering but weird. Thanks again to Mubi for sponsoring this video. As a special gift to our viewers, Mubi is offering 30 days free. Just click the link in the description below to start streaming now. If you're looking for more edgy animation after revisiting Daria, check out Leo Jin's Have a Nice Day. This sly animated neo-noir is a thrilling, biting critique of moral decay in today's China. If you're anything like me, these days you may be totally uninspired and stuck when it comes to figuring out what to watch next. Subscribing to Mubi completely fixes that. Their team of curators handpicks every film they show, so there's always something new to discover. They seriously love movies as much as we do, so their recommendations are always top-notch. Click the link in the description below to start streaming now. Though Daria remains relatable to viewers today, the character is also deeply rooted in her origins in the mid to late 1990s. So let's take a look at how Daria is a product of the 90s, and how her show actually subverts and deepens some aspects of 90s culture that had become prevalent even by 1997 when the show premiered. Daria springs from a popular cultural movement that made her popularity on television possible. The rise of grunge and later period Gen X culture circa 1992, finally displacing a lot of the remaining baby boomer driven culture that had flourished since the 1960s, made it fashionable to be sarcastic, anti-authority, and suspicious of selling out. Oh, dazzling academic achievement, eh? 
What a sellout. Look at bands like Nirvana, who brought punk rock values to the mainstream music charts, or movies like Reality Bites or Clerks, where disaffected young workers aren't sure what they want to do with their lives. I'm not even supposed to be here today! Oh. Though Daria's age technically makes her an older millennial rather than a true Gen Xer, she feels like an animated teenage version of live-action personalities like Janine Garofalo, who played the sarcastic best friend from Reality Bites and graduated to leading lady status right around the same time Daria premiered. According to a 2017 anniversary piece in Variety, other character designs were picked up from other bits of 90s culture. Jane's brother, Trent, was named after Nine Inch Nails mastermind Trent Reznor and based on Jane's addiction guitarist, Dave Navarro, while the design of Mr. DiMartino, a perpetually angry teacher at Lawndale High, was modeled on Christopher Walken's appearance in Pulp Fiction. I want to volunteer with the answer. Now! Daria, stop showing off! But if the show lovingly incorporated a lot of 90s culture into its world, it also went in some bold new directions. In 1997, it was already rare to build a TV show around teenagers. My So-Called Life was a one-season-and-done cancellation victim just a few years earlier, and Dawson's Creek wouldn't premiere until 1998, and it was even rarer to build one around a female protagonist. It was especially rare to see a teenage girl so skeptical of her family, peers, and authority, a smart girl character who isn't a nerdy teacher's pet or obsessed with behaving properly. This is the part where you say, hey, way to go, congratulations. Hey, way to go. Congratulations. Congratulations. Even a subversive teenage and girl-centric comedy like Heather's, which came out at the tail end of the 1980s, looked at popularity from the inside, assuming the perspective of a teenage girl with experience in her school's highest social cast. Just like, there are people I work with and our job is being popular and shit. Daria begins and ends her series as an outsider. Her experience is especially Gen X and 90s in that it's not necessarily specific people who are Daria's sworn enemies, but the entire system of popularity, phoniness, clueless authority figures, and consumerism that she wants to opt out of. It's not nerds versus preps versus jocks, it's Daria and her artist best friend Jane versus the world. As Megan Coaster writes, Daria and Jane operate as quip machines, but do so solely in order to create protective armor around themselves in a hostile world. One more night with those whose stupidity has so tormented and entertained us low these many years. Coaster also observes that Daria's angst penetrates the whole world of the show. Quote, Daria's sister Quinn, who at first glance appears to have it all together as a popular mean girl, is nevertheless riddled with existential ennui. There's some irony in the fact that Daria the character was so disdainful of popularity, while Daria the show was able to take on this point of view only in a time where that was a culturally cool thing to do. The fact that Daria was in step with cultural trends of the 90s made Daria the show popular and beloved. Another reason for that popularity probably has to do with how it's not quite as viciously satirical as it might seem. Kevin and Brittany, the jock and cheerleader pair who appear in most episodes, are much more dim-witted than actively cruel. The Pigskin Channel. Great big guys slamming into other great big guys. Fun. Cool. Some of Kevin and Brittany's friendliness comes from a myopia and self-involvement that can't allow them to conceive someone treating them with disdain or derision, as Daria and Jane sometimes do. Do you know where you're going yet? It's a secret, man. Why? Is the school embarrassed? Why would it be embarrassed? I'm a QB. It's not like I'm a brain or anything. Truer words were never spoken. Thanks, man! At the same time, the show does seem to regard Brittany, at least, affectionately. Oh, Daria! Now we can have womanly talks! Unlike Quinn, she's never really cast as Daria's enemy or tormentor. As Eichler told Variety, we were satirizing people, but I hope we were sympathetic. And the show further departs from Daria's caustic point of view by exploring the very different problems of Jodie Landon, a high-achieving black teenage girl who is intensely aware of both the expectations her parents place on her I'd finally get a break from having to be the perfect Jodie doll at a mostly white school and of how Lawndale treats her and her similarly accomplished boyfriend Mac as tokens of a diversity that doesn't really exist in their student body. Isn't it great how they keep electing us homecoming king and queen every year? It's such a generous and enlightened gesture. It completely makes up for the town's utter lack of diversity, in my mind. This balance between anti-authority satire and a softer, more palatable side of teenage alienation is what makes Daria feel late 90s in particular. The show became popular by capitalizing on the fashionableness of alienation, which mirrored the post-grunge gold rush toward alternative rock over on the music side of MTV. Why can't you smile when somebody takes your picture? 
I don't like to smile unless I have a reason. Nirvana was influenced by punk and indie bands of the 70s and 80s, but a lot of popular post-Nirvana bands didn't actually sound much like punk. They sounded like Nirvana. Or other popular influences that didn't have much to do with the punk or indie scene Nirvana emerged from. Similarly, Daria the character is rightfully disdainful of a lot of the failings she sees in society, while Daria aired in an MTV lineup that at various times in Daria's run included shows like Total Request Live or Singled Out. To survive on MTV in the late 90s, Daria must have been able to appeal to at least some segment of that audience without making them feel they were just being mocked. This doesn't make the show hypocritical, it actually gives it an interesting generational subtext. Daria is forced to interact with the society she disdains, rather than just shut herself out from feelings or engagement with her community. Just as a lot of 90s kids were gradually learning the limits of their teenage rebellion or disaffection. I'm not being negative. I'm being edgy. Indeed, it's telling that Daria actually ran into the middle of 2001 with a final wrap-up movie that aired in January 2002. By this point in pop culture, the irony, disaffection, and alienation of certain 90s cultural touchstones were giving way to a more optimistic millennial sensibility. Just as alternative rock fell out of favor at a time when boy bands and teen girl pop singers were gaining popularity again, the show ends with Daria graduating from Lawndale and heading for college, a life change that usually necessitates some kind of shift in worldview now that the easier targets of high school are left behind. Daria was cynical about that possibility, too. What do you think we'll find when we get there? Hmm. That the students are shockingly ignorant, the professors self-centered and corrupt, and the entire system geared solely to the pursuit of funding. But her show clearly believed that some kind of progress, or at least survival, was possible. Given the unalterable fact that high school sucks, I'd like to add that if you're lucky enough to have a good friend and a family that cares, it doesn't have to suck quite as much. Daria may have moved on to college at the end of the series, but the series itself has stuck with fans and continued to influence popular culture. Some viewers might look at the 2001 movie Ghost World as a live-action version of Daria. The lead characters are two young women who are best friends and outsiders. They're derisive of their stupid high school classmates and the consumerism they see everywhere. Everyone's too stupid. One of them has an artistic sensibility that seems destined to be misunderstood, and their fashion choices are not preppy or mainstream. It's obviously a 1977 original punk rock look. I guess Johnny face over there is too stupid to realize it. But though the movie Ghost World came out around the time Daria was ending its run, it's based on a comic book that ran throughout the 90s and may have actually influenced the Daria series in both writing and its art style. There are times when the thick lines and vivid but semi-static facial expressions on Daria resemble a comic strip. Both the movie and the comic of Ghost World are a lot more cutting and a lot less hopeful than Daria. I used to think about one day, just not telling anyone, going off to some random place. And I just... Disappear. And whereas Ghost World is acerbic and designed to appeal more to specific subcultures, the big Daria impact is that it brought that cutting sensibility further into the mainstream. Since then, there are a lot of characters in the wake of Daria who feel influenced by her sensibility, like Diane from BoJack Horseman. She's basically Asian Daria, right? With the glasses and the jacket and her whole blah thing. Or Lindsay Weir on Freaks and Geeks, who's more earnest and emotionally open, but essentially someone questioning her good girl past and trying out a more Daria-like personality, even donning a similar green jacket. Yeah, how come your sister is dressing so weird now? What do you mean? I don't know, I mean, she's been wearing your dad's army jacket. Lizzie Kaplan's characters in both Mean Girls and Party Down have Daria lineage. Janice from Mean Girls is sarcastic and disdainful of popular kids, while Casey on Party Down is like a grown-up version of that personality type, still uncertain about what exactly comes next for her. Thanks to its sensibility, Daria wasn't marketed as the same kind of teenage sensation as shows like Dawson's Creek, which ran around the same time. I don't think in very commercial terms, Eichler told Variety years later. Dawson's Creek was on the same time we were on, and if I could think like those people, I'd have a much bigger house, but that's okay. And though Daria wasn't as heavily watched as Dawson at the time, her show may actually be more beloved and influential today. Maybe all along, Daria Morgendorfer was a lot more popular than she ever realized. I really look up to you and your opinion's important to me. You look up to me? Huh. Oh, hi friends. This is The Take on all of your favorite movies, TV shows, and pop culture. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. We're gonna need a bigger screen.